electromagnetic field and its effect on us mere terrestrial mortals. And there's been a tremendous build-up in the number of sunspots on the sun and also a tremendous build-up in, in solar activity generally. He is Dr Percy Seymour, Senior Lecturer in Astronomy at the Plymouth Polytechnic. He's one of Britain's leading astronomers and an expert in cosmic magnetism. Magnetism has always played a significant role in the life of Plymouth. It was from here that Sir Francis Drake, the Pilgrim Fathers on the Mayflower and Captain James Cook set sail, compass in hand, to broaden the British Empire. And their travels gave this city a prominent place on the world map. Well now, magnetism has again brought prominence to Plymouth, but polarised the scientific world. Welcome to the Plymouth Planetarium. Dr Seymour is also the director of the William Day Planetarium. He's controversial because he's come up with a mathematical theory most other astronomers say is a load of bunkum. The positions of the planets at the birth, or at the natural birth of a child can label the inherited genetic characteristics of that child. If that sounds a little familiar, what the good doctor is proposing is a scientific basis for the ancient practice of astrology. He believes it's not magical or mystical, but magnetic. But before we continue, let's just clarify one aspect of the theory. It doesn't really provide any basis for predictive uh, astrology, saying that on such and such a day, you are going to meet someone who's going to play a very big part in your life. I do not see my theory is providing a basis for that type of astrology. You have a series of biological clocks in the fetus that are genetically inherited and basically the magnetic field of Earth uh, which carries information on planetary, solar and lunar positions are synchronizing these clocks and causing the countdown to birth, telling the baby when it ought to come into the world. Taken step by step, the theory does seem logical enough the Sun itself has a huge magnetic field which is influenced by the alignment of the planets. It consumes more than one million tonnes of its own matter every second in an ongoing fusion reaction. And that creates a wind which blows throughout the solar system. While the Earth's own blanket of magnetism deflects the solar wind, its strength is changed by it. Those changes influence many beings on Earth. Ocean-dwelling bacteria use the field in their search for food, and birds and fish use it to navigate. So why not human behavior as well? The theory is actually a mathematical theory. It involves the mathematics of resonance. And resonance tells us that very small effects can have large consequences if there is a tuning between the force uh, and the uh, agency on which it is acting. Dr. Seymour's theory has three parts to it. Let me show you. First of all, the alignment of the planets affects solar activity. That activity on the surface of the sun then influences the Earth's magnetic field. And finally, that magnetic field and changes to it affects the fetus to determine the moment of birth. The notion that we receive messages while in the womb is backed up by the work of French psychologist Michel Gauquelin. Over the last 30 years, Gokulans compared the exact birth times of thousands of professionals with the positions of the planets and has proved that the positions of Mars, Venus, Saturn and Jupiter, for example, correspond with nine personality traits. And Dr. Seymour says a physical agency has to be involved, a magnetic signal from the cosmos. If a child was born on that point on the surface of the Earth, then for that child the sun would just be setting. So the child is being born at sunset. Now if in addition Saturn was in that position, that position, this position, or right over there, then the likelihood of that child being a great scientist is considerably increased, according to my theory. If the galactic pioneer from Plymouth is right, then he's made a profound contribution to our understanding of the human condition. But rather than a claim, Dr. Seymour has found himself alone in a very large universe. Astrologers think he's trying to debunk their craft, and astronomers, of course, are skeptical of anything to do with astrology. 
it, it is uncomfortable to be in this position. It's, I, I can't say it's, it's, uh, it's uh, something that I, I totally enjoy. Um, because, I mean, some of the, the people who I knew very well and who um, I would have called friends uh, are now no longer friends. Um, the um, Secretary General of the International Astronomical Union, um, Dr. McNally, was interviewed by um, Omni, and he knows me very well. We have had many dealings over the years, and he, his um, reaction was that, uh, I think Percy's flipped his lid, and I wouldn't follow him anywhere. Being ostracized by the scientific community puts Dr. Seymour in the company of Copernicus, Galileo and Einstein, whose theories were all ridiculed at first. And like his illustrious predecessors, all he asks is an objective assessment of his work. I, I found that the whole idea very exciting to, to actually see that there might be more to some of the ancient wisdoms than we had so far, than up to now we had been willing to admit. But I was also quite aware that it was likely to, um, to lead to a lot of criticism from both sides. But uh, I, I think that if you choose a life of science, that is, is a risk you've got to take. That you, um, a scientist must be willing to, to put his um, ideas on the line, even if he doesn't believe them as gospel truth. I don't believe that that my theory is gospel truth. I'm saying, here's a theory, let's test it. This position. So the cosmic controversy yeah. continues, and this time, Jupiter or rules the right debate. There. Then that child is likely to have the qualities that would make it a great politician. And perhaps um, a beyond 2,000 journalist? Oh, well, they, they're the same as politicians. Oh, my God. <laughs> to run across this stage and Laurence Olivier was here. It's Laurence Olivier's Othello. And I spoke the wrong lines. I came on as a messenger and I spoke Iago's lines instead. He chose and, uh, to audition a scene from Othello, the very play Olivier was performing at the time. Whether it was Antony's talent or audacity that impressed Olivier isn't clear. But at age 29, he won a place in the most prestigious theater company in the world. Although he has continued to work successfully in theatre over the years, he doesn't have the traditional English actor's appetite for the stage. Early on, he found greener pastures in Hollywood. Would you say, Father, that I have the makings of a king? Splendid king. I won't pay off His first film was a big one. Walking.